I'm Al Roker on our green roof here at 30 Rock in New York. It's the perfect place to talk about small steps we can all take to protect our planet as we face a climate in crisis. At the top of the world, the Earth is firing a warning shot. A huge factor in sea level rise is happening right here in Greenland. Greenland has enough ice to raise sea levels globally by 25 feet. With temperatures rising, hundreds of millions of people around the world will be affected. Cities are at risk, but while that may seem like a problem years away, right now, this should be one of the best summers of their lives. Everyday life is already changing. We are trying to make the world aware of this. And livelihoods are already being threatened. We probably lost something in the order of about 500 customers this summer. So I just hit the permafrost. You just hit the permafrost. In Alaska, we go underground to see what's thawing beneath the surface. NBC News now presents Climate in Crisis. We've all heard the words climate change and global warming, but we don't always discuss how we're all playing a role in it. Over the course of this program, we're hoping to pull back the curtain on what those changes mean and perhaps what can be done about it. But to begin, Deborah Baskin takes us back about 150 years. From sweltering heat waves to rising seas, the effects of climate change are being felt all over the globe. Since records began being kept in the late 19th century, the 10 warmest years on record have all been set since 1998. And the four warmest, they've each been set since 2014. But some people still doubt that climate change is real. But here's how we know it is. Burning fossil fuels release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, trapping heat and creating a greenhouse effect. And this warms the Earth. Now in the US, the source of this pollution isn't smokestacks, it's how we get around. And Americans are driving more, flying more, and buying more. And that free next day delivery we love so much comes at serious environmental cost. Globally, sea levels have risen by about eight inches in the last century. Now that might not sound like much, but in the past 2,000 years, they barely changed. The cause is melting ice. In just seven years since the turn of the century, the amount of ice that is melted around the world would be enough to cover the entire United States a foot and a half deep. And all this warming began in the 1800s in the industrial age when we started burning fossil fuels for energy. Even if you don't feel it yourself yet, climate change is already touching on every aspect of our lives, from how much we spend on groceries today to how much our commute might cost tomorrow to where we might decide to live in the future. Slowing down climate change will take major global policy, but there are things that we can do, like considering what we eat and how we travel, that can make a difference. Also making a difference, tropical waters now creeping north into the Arctic and causing glaciers to melt at a more rapid pace. I got a first-hand look at it as I traveled with NASA scientists to Greenland. Greenland a massive island at the top of the world and one of the most remote places on Earth. This breathtaking landscape is ground zero for climate change, where the Arctic is warming twice as fast as anywhere else on the planet. I traveled to the tiny island of Kulasuk to better understand what all these changes mean for us back home. Why should they care about what happens up here in Greenland? For us, Greenland is a bit of a canary in the coal mines. Of the New York University professor David Holland and his wife Denise are conducting research here. In June of 2018, Denise capturing a spectacular event, a four mile wide, half mile deep, and more than mile long chunk of ice breaking away from the Helheim Glacier, dumping 10 billion tons of ice into the ocean. They didn't know they were in for yet another one in 2019. A plume opened up directly in front of the glacier. And so we hovered over and launched a probe. What's really surprising is the warm water. It came all the way up through the glacier, right to the top of the ocean, bubbling up and melting the glacier like crazy. 
we measured it top to bottom and it's all warm. There's no cold water anywhere. This groundbreaking discovery tells scientists that the speed of glacial melt may have just doubled. Professor Holland invited me on board his icebreaker turned research vessel to see how his team is studying the ocean's effect on the glaciers. Is the rate of warming something you're looking at? So when we look out on the ocean here, it's very cold water, and that's the top several hundred feet are all coming from the Arctic Ocean and pouring southward. But surprisingly, water from the tropics, the Gulf Stream, is lying underneath all of this, and it's flowing towards that glacier and others, and when it hits them, it melts them like crazy. Our mission today, retrieve, then redeploy a device that's been taking daily measurements of the ocean's temperature, salinity, and depth. The warmer water on the bottom from the tropics is what's leading to a lot of melting of the glacier. Um, so it's important to keep track of that layer and how warm it is and how thick it is. Ah, there it is. Mm -hmm. It's up. Once we raise it from the deep, Data is removed and batteries checked. And once you download all the data, then what do you do with it? So once we get the data off of it, we can plot it. Warm water was detected, but the actual rise in temperature and its effect will take a year to analyze. Time now to resubmerge. Next, we take to the skies. with NASA's Oceans Melting Greenland mission, better known by the acronym OMG. Two, one, drop, drop, drop. Similar to the NYU team, scientists are deploying probes to measure the temperature and salt content of the water. Greenland has enough ice to raise sea levels globally by 25 feet, which is an enormous amount. If that much sea level rise happened today, Hundreds of millions of people around the world would be affected. We have clear signs of climate change where we're flying right now. Absolutely. We can see, especially in Greenland, the impact of the warming through the retreat of the glacier. The extent of ice melt here in Greenland will actually help determine just how high sea levels will rise. I ended my epic adventure on what's left of the Apasuya Glacier with guide Nico Segreta. Sure where it was. Nico, what, what did this glacier used to look like? The glacier height was at the height of the mountain right there. So this to me is a very big volume of water that today is in the ocean right. and it's not on land anymore. All this ice that's fallen off, we've been hearing it and seeing it, and it's going into the ocean. What happens? It's very important here, standing on ice, to realize that we are on the first step of a domino effect that then later we call climate change. Places like Greenland do offer a first warning about climate change. But just a few miles from where I'm standing, Warming waters are already changing family vacations in a very different way. And Thompson takes us to a New Jersey lake that's no longer what it used to be. You don't have to go to where polar bears live to see the impact of climate change. In fact, ducks will do just fine. This is Lake Hopatcong in the exotic locale of New Jersey. I imagine when we do this story, people are going to go, Climate change? New Jersey? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> For Jessica Murphy, it's no laughing matter. Lake Hopatcong, where she grew up, got married, and still spends summers, fouled this year by an algae bloom, restricting swimming for much of July, sinking Murphy's plans to give her three children the kind of summer she enjoyed. This should be one of the best summers of their lives, and instead it was kind of off limits, and that was really heartbreaking to see because I never experienced anything like that. The algae bloom fueled by heavy rains, runoff from the surrounding towns, and water temperatures that have jumped almost three degrees Fahrenheit in 20 years. It's a warning signal and 
everyone's taking it very seriously from the local uh, residents and stakeholders all the way up to the uh, state government. Fred Love now oversees the lake's restoration, including these floating harvesters clearing the bottom. The fact that you need to mow the bed of the lake, is that a signal of climate change? It is in, uh, um, relative to how much sooner we're seeing the plants grow. So the fact that 10 years ago we wouldn't see plant growth begin until April or May, uh, now we see it starting as early as February. That right there is a signature of climate change. The bloom tying up businesses around the lake, including Ray Fernandez Bridge Marina. You know, we probably lost something in the order of about 500 customers this summer. Wow. We didn't launch as many boats this year in regards to our boat rentals, like they just weren't in the water. It's no better in the winter. A century ago, this was home to a thriving ice business where people skated and even sailed on the frozen lake. And for Tim Clancy, it was an ice fishing paradise. The most popular ice fishing lake in all New Jersey, mainly because we generally used to have more ice than anybody else, and now? is like a pack. Of According to the Knee Deep yeah. Fishing Club, 26 ice fishing contests have been canceled since 1998. Oh, yeah. The water just doesn't freeze enough. To think that, you know, in our watch, that we're going to let this slip through our hands. I hope not. State climatologist Dave Robinson says New Jersey's climate is out of balance, with many more record warm months than cold. Average temperatures have climbed three degrees Fahrenheit in the last century. The only state in the lower 48 warming more, Rhode Island. And what's causing this warming? Well, it's overall, it's the global warming pattern that we're seeing from human activity. Data shows a 50 to 1 ratio in favor of warming, with impacts across New Jersey. At the shore, sea level is up 15 inches in the last century, leaving communities even more vulnerable to events like 2012 Superstorm Sandy. And in the Pinelands, winters are no longer cold enough to kill off invasive species. Dave, what can the rest of the country learn from New Jersey? It's going to take a team effort. Uh, and, that's what, and it starts at home and it goes right through up through the levels of government. This didn't happen overnight. It's not going to be resolved or mitigated overnight. At the lake, Jessica Murphy is heeding the many red flags of climate change. If it could happen in, in this little on this little corner of the world, you know, it can really happen anywhere. A once future threat now at our shores. By now, it's clear that warming and rising waters are one of the biggest ways we'll feel the impacts of climate change. For many places on the eastern seaboard, communities are experiencing increased coastal flooding. And those rising waters are putting pressure on many important landmarks as well. Climate change is causing sea levels to rise higher and faster than ever before. Oceans are rising about an inch every eight years, and it's starting to add up. It's concerning because more water means more flooding. It's really coming through now. The water's breaching. We're getting a lot of activity as far as flooding is concerned. When people talk about sea level rise, why is it of concern? Sea level rise flooding of the coast has already begun. So little storms now are starting to have bigger impacts. A rise of six inches can actually mean a lot. Because six inches, that's half a foot. That doesn't sound like much. One foot of sea level rise by 2050, we're really talking about big problems at that point. And the impact of those rising sea levels are already being felt up and down the East Coast, from Boston, New York City, to Norfolk and Miami. Sea level rise is already impacting several of our major installations, Norfolk, for instance. The U.S. naval base in Norfolk and its surrounding communities are already being affected by increased storms and nuisance flooding. There are areas of base that have the potential to flood, so, so it is a concern in some areas. But in most parts of the base, um, this uh, riprap does its job. A recent Department of Defense report suggests that more than half of U.S. military installations are vulnerable to sea level rise. Is that going to mean we're probably going to have to divert money to, to harden these installations from the rise of the ocean? It will mean something needs to be done. They're critically important, obviously, for national defense. The Department of Defense tells today, in part, the effects of a changing climate are a national security issue with potential impacts to Department of Defense missions and, quote, works to ensure installations and infrastructure are resilient to a wide range of challenges, including climate. The tide's going to go where the tide wants to go. 
The tide is also creeping towards the launch pads in Cape Canaveral, Florida. Rising sea levels will have an adverse impact on important landmarks like this active launch pad here at the Kennedy Space Center. At the rate we're going, climate researchers predict a future where major cities, including our nation's capital, could look like this. A lot of our landmarks, a lot of our history is along the coast. Lady Liberty. Well, a lot of our landmarks, like the Statue of Liberty or historic Jamestown, are located in you know, critical areas of our country. Jamestown, Virginia, is at risk of being washed away. Jamestown, as an island, is very low-lying property, and that's part of the reason the colonists chose to settle here. But for us today, the peninsula where this island is is sinking and affecting those sacred resources that are the beginnings of our nation. The winds right now gusting at over 55 to 60 miles per hour. As the ocean creeps up, the waves start attacking the shoreline, the erosion becomes more noticeable, and the beaches are disappearing. Research suggesting many parts of the East Coast no longer have a stable shoreline. So we can see through history how technology and society coming together can lead to rapid change. So in a way, you're talking about a climate moonshot. That's right. We have to hope that we're never too late. We have to engage fully to reduce emissions and to prepare for those climate changes that we're locked into. Some areas are looking at building seawalls, and in places like Nantucket, an island off Cape Cod, residents are going as far as picking up entire homes and moving them away from the shoreline. Our friend and colleague, Lester Holt, spent part of his childhood in Alaska, a place that might make you think of icebergs and long, harsh winters. But as Alaskans will tell you, winters there are beginning to look a lot different. Frozen lakes and rivers are no longer a sure thing, as the 49th state warms faster than any state in the country and faster than almost any other place on the planet. So Lester returned to Alaska's famed Portage Glacier to see how it's changed since his childhood. Humbling in its massive scale and grandeur, every turn a postcard. There is no place quite like Alaska. But tonight, scientists are warning this rugged beauty belies a troubling reality. Alaska is melting. This summer, forest fires scorched more than two and a half million acres. Anchorage hit 90 degrees for the first time. This is definitely an existential threat for the, uh, the stability of, of the way that we live our lives right now. I lived in Alaska for four years as a child. My father was stationed here in the Air Force. I want to take you to a place we used to go as a family that I think illustrates the kind of change we're talking about. My destination, Portage Lake. Last time I came here, I think it was 1970. This is a photo of my grandmother at that same spot. That's me playing in the background. The lake back then was filled with ice chunks, and just beyond was Portage Glacier, but no more. Portage Glacier has receded more than three miles in the last century. You used to be able to see it standing right where I am, but now the only way to view it is by boat. After a 15-minute sail, Portage Glacier finally reveals itself. What we're looking at now, at some point it retreats into the mountain. Absolutely. As long as our winters keep getting warmer, it's going to keep moving back. And how fast it moves back depends on the, the summer temperatures, the winter snowfall. These pictures show just how much of Portage has disappeared since 1914. Melting glaciers contribute to rising sea levels and warming oceans. But just as alarming to scientists here in Alaska is what's happening below ground. The warming earth is literally changing what's beneath our feet. For most of Alaska, that would be permafrost, a frozen layer of earth made up of soil and gravel. The permafrost is thawing, raising concerns the release of carbon dioxide and methane could lead to even more warming. So I just hit the permafrost. You just hit the permafrost. Just outside Fairbanks, I venture into a place where time is literally frozen. The Army Corps of Engineers permafrost tunnels, where 40,000 years of Earth's history are studied. Ice, ancient grass, even woolly mammoth bones. Is that a, that a bone there? Yeah, good eye. That's a, that's a mammoth bone. Uh, people love mammoths. Um, this is a step bison horn right oh, yeah, here. see the horn right there. Yeah. Yep. The tunnels, originally built in the 60s to study underground construction. Just kind of need to feel how cold yeah. it is. Yeah, that's, 
That's, that's, it feels cold, That's huh? solid ice. Yep. Now, that melting permafrost is heaving roads and sinking houses as temperatures rise. It's in a very long, steady warming. But the last 20 or 30 years in this area, that rate of warming has increased quite a bit. The Alaska of my childhood still remains largely untouched, yet alarm bells are ringing here. We'll see it if we'll see it in the photo books. Um, I thought about that picture of your grandmother and what inspired uh, your family to take that picture that day. And it wasn't just that there was this, this pretty lake around us. It was that lake filled with those large icebergs and that towering glacier right behind her. What we have in that picture is an opportunity uh, to connect with a wild northern landscape. And that's, that's what still draws people here today. Now we want to go south to the Amazon rainforest, where this summer, devastating fires have made a lot of headlines. And almost all of those fires have been intentionally set to clear land for farming and development. But as Kerry Sanders explains from Brazil, the consequences are global. The Amazon rainforest covers more than 2 million square miles, representing over half of the planet's remaining rainforests. This vast jungle is home to the largest collection of plants, animals, and insects on Earth. Of the world's known species, one in 10 lives here. But it's how everything here in this rainforest works in concert that makes this part of the world so critical for everyone else. The lush plants here absorb carbon dioxide and release oxygen, an untouched environment with an impressive and telling nickname. The Amazon is often referred to as the lungs of the planet. What's going on there? Well, the, the Amazon is very important for containing global warming because the Amazon uh, hold so much carbon in the forest. And as we saw while traveling the Amazon, so much of this is now threatened by man as profitable agriculture and cattle farming claims what was Amazon jungle. Smoke from fires intentionally set to clear the land is filled with the same problematic carbon emitted by cars and power plants. And the Amazon is burning at a record rate. Just this year, 2,472 square miles of the Amazon have been destroyed by fires, almost the size of Delaware, a 92% increase over last year. It's fast disappearing. And that is not only a concern for you, but for the world? It's a concern for, for the world, for all of us. Scientists say once trees are gone, the rain cycle disappears and the land dries out. And on a scale the size of the Amazon, that shift impacts weather patterns worldwide. And, and changing air currents in the, in the atmosphere and, of course, through greenhouse gases and global warming. This is a tremendous global uh, problem. Scientists say destruction like this here in Hondonia, Brazil, have impacts far beyond the Amazon rainforest. In Iowa and across the Midwest, climate scientists say they're already seeing changes in weather patterns, hurting corn and soybean farmers. And on the West Coast, it's predicted we'll see even more wildfires, a global cause and effect that traces back in part here to the vanishing Amazon. My colleague Al Roker was recently in Greenland and witnessed things, melts, changes there. Related to what's going on here? Very much so, because global temperatures are increasing and uh, deforestation is one of the things that adds to that. Another problem, when the trees are gone, so too is the shade, which means the Amazon River begins to heat up. Because the destruction of the rainforest has been happening for decades, scientists fear if just 3% more of the Amazon burns, it will reach a tipping point. If we lose all that carbon into the atmosphere, it will be very hard not to let the planet warm up exceedingly. The Amazon isn't only just the lungs of the earth, but it's home to thousands of medicinal plants, also a source of life-saving medicines. So we wanted to ask Dr. John Torres all about this. So Dr. John, tell me, uh, the Amazon, just how important is it when it comes to 
different kinds of medicines and different kinds of conditions. Well, it's extremely important, and it's been basically the natural pharmacy that we've used over the last couple hundred years to get some of our own medications. As a matter of fact, globally, 80% of developing countries rely on these natural medicines for their basic health care needs. Here in the United States, there's been numerous discoveries based on medicines we found that they're using naturally in the Amazon that we've been able to synthesize and turn into our own medications. The force is saving lives, and it needs to continue to save lives. Are, are there even medicines that we haven't discovered yet that are still there due to the plant life and the flora and fauna that's that's at the Amazon? There definitely are medicines down there that we haven't discovered. Right now they think that we've probably discovered less than 1% of what's available out there. And without those plant sources, we're not going to be able to discover new ones going forward. So you've got these medicinal plants all over the world, not just the Amazon, uh, facing these, these threats uh, environmentally. What What happens to us? if we continue to see this loss? Well, a lot of experts are saying that unfortunately, if these plants start going away, we're not able to get to this point where we can continue to have these new discoveries, especially with things like antibiotics, we're gonna go back to pre-1950s medicine where these diseases that have been eliminated essentially from our lives are gonna be making comebacks. We're gonna have a hard time treating them. Science isn't able to keep up that fast without these natural products. These natural products being not just in the Amazon, but in these forests and different areas across the world. It's important that we preserve that so we can continue to discover what's out there. Dr. John, some good thoughts. Thank you very much. You Earlier, we talked a lot about sea level rise thanks to melting ice. But as waters warm, ice isn't the only thing being chased away. Here's part of my conversation with a Rhode Island lobsterman about what's happening to his catch. Would you say the waters are warming up rapidly? I'm only 30 years old, and to notice the waters warming in my adult lifetime, I would, I would call that rapidly. A scary shift, because as waters have warmed, the lobster haul here has plunged down from 8 million pounds 20 years ago to just 2 million in 2017. The lobsters, everything they do is temperature related, so mating, feeding, uh, migrations. There are now aggressive measures in place to protect the industry. Measure like that, and but with a young family to support, we... lobsterman Greg Mataronis is concerned females, it won't so be enough. I don't want to think about having to do something else. Believe me, I do think about it, but I don't want do to have really? to. Do you really? Do you think about it? I do, yes. I mean, I, I still have a lot of work career left, and I just wonder if 20 years from now, if I'm going to be struggling. Like Greg, commercial fishermen often see climate change first. And for the most part, they're fishing in boats built in the 1970s. As one industry insider put it, imagine if all the cars on the road were from the 1970s. That's how dirty it is. To clean up their act, some companies are investing in cleaner technology. But the expense and ever-changing regulations make it a risky investment. Jacob Ward takes us on board one of the newest and cleanest boats money can buy. Fishing boat captains live by the patterns of the ocean. And that's why Captain Bob Hezel sees climate change so clearly. Those patterns have been disrupted. Scientists have said for years that warming oceans will harm the fishing industry. A fishing boat may not be able to find the fish where it always has because they have moved north, they are mixed in with different species, or they are deeper and harder to find. In fact, right now, a massive heat bloom is changing thousands of miles of the Pacific Ocean. The last time this happened, five years ago, marine life was decimated. Alaska's southern coast alone lost more than 100 million Pacific cod. Captain Hezel has to adapt to survive. We have 35, 40 year old boats as an average up there and that technology and, and those old engines and that older steel, I mean, that's just not applicable for where we need to go to be efficient. And that means he needs a new species of boat. This is America's finest, a 264 foot factory trawler. That's the term for a boat that is a whole factory in the hold. This one uses electric cranes, robots, and a crew of 49. I was always wondering how, how many more years I was going to be able to do it. But now on this boat, with the technology we have here, maybe I could do this for another 15, 20 years. So why is this the first American factory trawler built on the West Coast in 30 years? One day you may have rights to fish certain species. The next day that may change. Uh, fishing quotas change. This year we may have a certain amount, next year we don't. And to make large capital investments in that environment is, is very difficult to do. American fishing is under two big pressures. The first is geopolitical. 
they're only allowed to catch a certain number of fish. They compete against other countries that don't abide by those restrictions, and tariffs have tanked the price of fish. The second is climate. The planet is changing. The oceans are warming, the fish are going all over the place. And so this $80 million boat, built to go further north than ever before, is in fact quite common in other countries because it's exactly what they will need to fish in the future. But here in the United States, this boat is one of a kind. This has a, a lot of um, sophistication built into it. And like I said, it's state of the art uh, in the world right now. A couple feet of ice, this thing could punch right through it. Right through it. Wow. These electric winches here, are able to pull about 70,000 pounds each. Wow! This whole deck opens up. Yeah, opens up, and we drop all the fish down. It holds about 80 tons in these two tanks. There's a whole factory under what we're standing on. Absolutely. Here. Wow. So you can do 20 miles an hour carrying Everything. hundreds of tons of fish. A uh, thousand. Still, it'll take this boat a decade to pay for itself. And both the climate and the politics could change in that time. No wonder so few companies want to pay to build one. The question is whether the American fishing industry, already endangered, can survive long enough to adapt to this changed world. As industries adapt, we as people have to adapt as well. The American supermarket is a unique luxury, buying almost anything you want to eat, regardless of season. As Chef Andrew Zimmern tells us, thinking more about what we eat, when we eat it, is something we should all be doing. In every country in the world, everywhere you go, the single biggest issue about how we're going to feed our hungry and hungrier planet has to do with climate. This is no longer a climate change, this is a climate crisis. As a global traveler, I'm hearing it every single place that I go. We are at the most fragile time in human existence in my lifetime and perhaps any time going back thousands of years. First, what's going to happen is rising prices, right? We're just going to pay more for things, going to be less of it. Then you're going to start to see seasonal displacement. We're addicted to having plums and tomatoes and watermelon, even corn in our supermarkets 12 months a year. The biggest thing that we can do is change diet and ease our pressure on the system. Take a few meals a week, not from pleasure. That's a radical idea, but it's actually how we existed as a species tens of thousands of years ago. If we don't decrease the pressure, then we are, combined with the climate changes, we are going to see disappearance of species that we've come to rely on to feed Americans and the global appetite for food. I've always felt lucky that American audiences have wanted me in their homes. I'm trying to now tell stories that are a little more serious with some of my new TV work because I think we're living in the most dangerous of times as a global people. If I tell you what to do, you know, then the chances of me actually impacting your life are small. If I tell you stories and let you decide for yourself, I think human beings are smart and resilient and nine times out of 10 are gonna make the right choice. Now, all of this may have left you wondering, hey, what can any of us do about all this? Well, the reality is major global climate policy, like the Paris Climate Agreement, are essential to reducing global emissions and slowing the warming. But we can all make a difference by thinking about how we live. Here's Gotti Schwartz. Saving the planet is a big job, but you, me, and everybody else on Earth has a carbon footprint, mostly generated by the energy we're using. So finding ways to reduce that are key. Remember, every time you click buy online, you're having something shipped to you, sometimes involving airplanes, a bunch of trucks, and a lot of pollution. For that one personalized delivery, consider what you can buy at the store just a few blocks away from home. Travel is obviously a great thing, and it opens you up to the world, but flying is the biggest source of greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. If you travel for meetings, see if any of those can be done remotely, and ask your boss about telecommuting one day a week. Fewer cars on the road mean less pollution. A lot of us love meat, but there's more to the meatless craze than just health. If you already eat meat five times a week, maybe think about cutting it down to four. Less meat production will ultimately mean less methane gas and a cooler planet. At home, consider an energy audit. You can save between 5 and 30% on your energy bills. But also, by figuring out where you're wasting energy, you can help fight climate change. 
You can do this yourself or by following online guides, or you can hire a pro, but without even going that far, just washing your clothes in cold water saves 75% of the energy laundry typically uses. And if you're feeling a little guilty about all the carbon you're generating, you can offset some of those emissions by buying what are called carbon offsets. Some experts recommend the U.S. Forest Service plant a tree program. Those trees are being planted on American soil where they're protected and many are going to grow to maturity. Just $10 buys 10 to 15 seedlings and the more trees near us mean cleaner air here at home. Climate change affects everybody. It doesn't care if you're black or white, rich or poor, male or female. And the notion that we can ignore it is just plain foolhardy. We are talking about the fate of our planet. We're seeing global temperatures rise at an alarming rate. We're seeing the world's oceans warming at an alarming rate. We're seeing a growing number of climate refugees, even though that term isn't broadly recognized in international law. We have our farmers dealing with changing soil and growing conditions. We have folks who are running out of clean running water because of drought. There's not one part of the globe that's not being affected by this both on a national level and on a global level. There's nothing more pressing, but I am optimistic, cautiously optimistic, that we can make changes. Part of that is because I've found people to be receptive when they have an open mind and don't come to these issues from an ideological viewpoint, that it can't be happening. Whether you're a conservative or a Democrat, a Republican or a liberal, people who are open to science and open to facts all agree that something's happening and we need to address it. But people can and will look at this information about the enormity of climate change and its effects and be overwhelmed. And so as we go forward as journalists, our job also is to point out the things we can do as individuals to have an effect. Even if it's a small thing like maybe eating a little less meat. This is the defining issue of our time, and we need to start acting like it in ways both big and small. Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.